very short introduction about Gary. So he started his professional life as a language teacher. Um, he worked in the UK, he's worked in the UK, in Libya and in Asia. Um, after working overseas, he returned to the UK to study at master's and doctorate level and also began working as, as a lecturer at the University of Manchester. Um, he set up and ran the innovative MA in Educational Technology and TESOL. Um, I think um, one person uh, here today, Alison Wood, uh, took that. Um, but this MA now runs with different options. Um, go to Gary's page on the University of Manchester, Manchester site to find a link to it. Uh, that's it from me. So over to Gary. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, as I was saying, this is. Uh, I'm Thanks very much for inviting me uh, to, to come along to this, obviously a, a big group of people. Um, and uh, I will do my best to uh, cover issues. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off by talking about some background material. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look at, uh, yeah, I look at issues that, that are connected with, with teaching languages at a distance. I'm going to give a few tips and tricks if you like. Um, and uh, then I'm going to, I'm going to refer out to uh, other materials uh, that, that are available in various spaces. And I'm also going to then, uh, you know, at the end, uh, I, I might, depending on how time goes, uh, I might sort of stop at various points and, and do various tasks and activities, but at the end I'm going to focus a, a little bit on a set of materials that Adam sent me, which I've had a look at, and give you the task of sort of thinking through uh, how you might adapt that, perhaps based on some of the ideas that I presented. So I've looked at the, the materials which were sent as a, as, as a doc. Um, and, and thought about, well, how, if I were going to do that, based on the sort of things that, that, uh, uh, that I've said, or the things that I kind of think and, and believe in, if you like, how that, that might actually work for me. So I've started sharing a document. Uh, I'm going to just, um, I can't see the chat at the moment, which uh, is an issue for me, because I was going to sort of use that as a way of collecting ideas so I'm going to stop the sharing a second and I'm going to put let me put this link into uh, the uh, into the chat so that is a link to the slides I'm using Google Slides uh, because I find Google Slides very effective uh, in the way that you can adapt them uh, easily uh, to, to, to your needs and you can import them in you can make them interactive uh, I mean, I recognize there might be restrictions. I don't know what the restrictions are, particularly like in Hong Kong. I know we work a lot with mainland Chinese students and they find it very difficult to access uh, tools like Google or, or YouTube and, and these kinds of things. Adam suggested that that wasn't particularly the case at the moment in Hong Kong, but maybe if your teaching students are off site, you've got other you know, you, you might have other issues. So, you know, I'm also exploring uh, with a number of our Chinese students alternatives. So you're probably well better aware of this than I am, but there are Chinese alternatives to, to, to Google. Uh, uh, for example, like Tencent Doc. Uh, I don't know whether anybody uses that. Big problem with that is the interface is in Chinese, but uh, it is possible to do that. There's also an alternative to Zoom. Um, that's uh, called Vuv, which is again a Chinese tool uh, based on, uh, it looks exactly the same as Zoom and it works in very similar ways, it doesn't quite have the same facility. So, you know, depending on where you're, uh, you know, working and, and delivering your courses, that then the, the choices you, you make are there. But if you want to do things like uh, get more interactivity going, uh, that there are various tools that are built into, in, into Zoom itself, uh, like a, an interactive whiteboard, for example, uh, but you can, uh, you know, make, make use of tools like Google at the same time. So Google Doc then, so if people uh, click on that link, they should be able to at least view that document and you can keep it for later uh, and click on the links and go else, elsewhere. So I can see that people are, are, are doing that. So I'm going to go back to... Um, 
back to my slides and I'm going to present that. Sorry, I'm just... Okay then, so I mean, the, I've set up uh, here, I'm going to actually, let me just put this on so that I can see what I'm doing. Uh, I'll present those. Okay, so I've actually set up uh, a, 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 a Mentimeter. I don't know whether people are familiar with this tool. These are, these are called responseware. So I'm sure that you've come across these kinds of tools. Uh, you can use them in, in different kinds of ways. So if you, if you click on that or put in your browser, uh, menti.com, uh, and use the code, uh, then you can go to, uh, to, to this, uh, this actual uh, uh, space. Uh, and you can uh, you can answer the question. So what I'll do is I'll show that, and I think I I need to change the uh, the actual. All right. So it's again there. So if you go to menti.com, uh, actually the code appears to be different there. Um, so put that code in fifty fifty eight twenty nine six, and you should be able to type. Uh, in uh, your ideas and they should uh, they should show on the screen. Would you like to try that? Oh, I just adjust the, the sharing on this. Sorry, if I go, what's the new code again? 50. It's 50, 58, 29, 6. There you go. So so somebody's got in. So could you detail the new challenges? Somebody's put in new challenges. What are some of the, the challenges? What are some of the glitches? So maybe eye strain is one of the challenges. Um, I certainly feel I need to go to a to uh, see an optician. So when you say lack of contact with students, what, what, what do you mean by that? What sort of sizes of class are we talking about? What, what makes it, uh, what, what, why is there a lack of contact? Okay, some other more positive things coming out as well so opportunities to rethink our teaching the idea of any time anywhere any place that's a typical definition of, of distance learning isn't it sort of the idea that you can do it particularly when you're talking about mobile learning okay finding a secure internet connection yeah repetitive strain injury okay yes indeed i certainly uh the other one of the issues that, that comes up is, you know, we're, we're sitting a lot. I mean, one of my colleagues at work, he, he does a lot of his teaching standing up. So, I mean, I've actually moved offices recently in terms of in my house office. So you can see behind me, I've got some some shelving. Uh, this isn't you know a background at the moment. So I've just got shelving there. Um, and I'm thinking of trying to set that up so that, that I can stand up. Hard to work to create interaction. OK, yeah, that's certainly true when you've got the numbers of people in 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 the session uh, like we have uh, like we have today. So, yeah, lots of issues then uh, for, for people to consider. And hopefully uh, I, I will, uh, you know, I'll come back to those. And one of the reasons why you use that kind of interactivity, I mean, you could make use of polls. Uh, there are polls normally available within uh, within uh, a tool like Zoom. Zoom is particularly good because of its functionality. I uh, wasn't actually able to set that up today because I didn't have the host right. So again, you know, it depends on your control over the system. It also depends on how much your institution has paid uh, for, for the tool uh, will depend on, on what facilities are available. So all these things are, are worth considering. Um, yeah, it might be hard to stand up and type at the same time, but you know, it, 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 I'm not saying you have to do that all the time, but if you're perhaps, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of talking, um, I mean, this colleague at, at Manchester says, you know, he, he can't, 
he finds it very difficult to to lecture and he talks about lecturing um uh, you know uh, while he's sitting down but you know the, the, the preferences i'm just just making that point so one of the, the people who's uh, talked a lot about uh, these kinds of uh, uh, issues, so I'm going to go back to, to my home field, if you like. I mean, I've uh, been involved in, in distance learning for, for a long time, as, as Alison mentioned. Uh, I'll plug here. We, of course, run online courses at, at, at Manchester and have been doing that for, for quite a long time. Um, and uh, as I had mentioned, you know, we, we moved into distance learning fairly early. Um, and, it, you know, I tend to go back to distance learning because I think, you know, even though people now refer to e-learning or, or kind of uh, modern, uh, modern distance education, uh, as it's sometimes referred to in, in the Chinese literature, there are still these kinds of uh, useful insights that we get from, from people like Michael Moore, who, who was one of the early theorists. So the idea that physical and temporal distance between the learner and the teacher gives rise to the pedagogical issues that must be mediated by structure of a course. So, you know, that idea that, you know, people mentioning the fact that, you know, getting interactivity, getting engagement. Um, so the fact that we, we've moved, I mean, there's been a massive shift. We could say that, you know, there's ultimately been a really big shift in, in the last few months into a much more synchronous mode. So certainly at my university and, and with other sessions, uh, you know, I've attended or, 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 or things I've done, interactions I've had with uh, colleagues around the world, clearly that move into synchronous has become quite, quite significant, uh, partly because, you know, for, uh, it's, it's very time consuming. We all know it's very time consuming to set up and create, um, um, sit up and uh, sorry, set up and create uh, asynchronous courses. It takes a lot of time to, to actually do that as people are now finding out because you know, that initial move online uh, meant that people simply ported their, their, their materials into, into a synchronous space and probably continue doing teaching in a very similar way. Um, whereas now people, they're being encouraged to, to look more significantly uh, at that. So, so use an exercise yoga board, I see, is actually one of the recommendations. I actually thought of trying to try a, a yoga ball, but uh, I haven't actually got one. So I see if I can get hold of one and, and do that because it would be useful. So thinking about those things, uh, you know, so sort of that, that physical and temporal distance is really, you know, one of the sort of key things and, and, and looking at how you actually manage that to maximize stuff that you have. So these ideas then came from a talk um, by a guy called Alan Tate. So I'm, you know, bringing in uh, uh, ideas and these are things that I believe in anyway, but I thought they were nicely summarized by Alan. Alan is, uh, was originally uh, worked at the, uh, 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 the Open University in the United Kingdom, and this is an Eden talk. So Eden uh, is the European Distance Education Network. So later on, if you come back to these slides, if you keep that URL, uh, you can have a look at some of these talks. And there were actually some really great talks, I thought, fr from that community. So one of the people mentioned, uh, you know, the, in, in the, the Mentimeter, the idea of, you know, building on experience. So, you know, you've obviously got experience, um, that you already have and, and it's very difficult to if you've not taught online before to to not take that experience that classroom experience um, into the online world but but over time begin to rethink things look at things afresh and, and, and think about how you, you might change things um, and you know I'm not one of these people who who says that that online and distance are radically different from face to face. I think it's a different space. It's a multimodal space. It works in a very different kind of way. Yes, but but ultimately, you know, the the, the teaching skills you have are equally as adaptable uh, to to that kind of space. So you know, think about ways that you do that. He also talked about not looking back. You know, let go of the past. So okay, you know, we we we, we don't, don't necessarily hanker for the, the actual uh, physical spaces that, 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 that we're, we're used to. Uh, maybe it's time to, to rethink what we do in, in that kind of way. So, you know, I mean, I've often argued that, that you know, I wondered why, you know, we see physical teaching as, you know, the gold standard. Distance education seems always to be the poor relation. Um, 
and and maybe not you know looking at it from that perspective not saying you know this is a you know more difficult space to work in but actually look at its affordances and think you know uh, think through that so that's what essentially the next bullet point says don't start with the idea of dl as a deficit model so if you see it as deficit um then um you know if you see it as deficit it will remain deficit in your mind so try and you know get get over that idea and, and think more positively about it but you know we, students and teachers for that matter have have fears have you know need, need to sort of uh, understand we need to understand as, as teachers that, that people are worried about, about this kind of context I mean, i'm just looking at uh, dissertations at the moment and people are doing inevitably of course they are doing sort of looking at the the, the impact of covid19 on, on different educational processes mostly in mainland china um uh, and 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 the the, the results are, are, are quite mixed um, but yes, that fear that I'm not going to do as well in this kind of environment. And we were talking at the beginning about you know, the impact on the changes on, on for example, exam results in, in the UK. It has been a massive mess. Um, and hopefully over the next couple of years, we might, you know, we might sort of, uh, you know, rectify that. But, but still, you know, people do have fears about we're not learning effectively. It's not as good as this. And, and taking into account some of those ideas that are at the beginning there might help to get around that. So being positive, um, you know, uh, and that is something that, that's important, you know, being really positive about, about doing it. If you're negative about the environment, then, of course, the students are going to pick up on that. So students already have uh, an online life. Um, and one of the things, uh, you know, we, we often don't do um, uh, is we don't actually ask them uh, what, uh, what they know about online learning uh, or, or what tools they use. We tend to impose on them particular tools uh, and, uh, you know, hope that, that, that that's going to work. But often it, it's worth sort of considering what, what people use. And the other point he made, which I think, again, is also really useful, particularly in, in the area of language teaching, is, um, you know, that the, the work as a team uh, and, and use your strengths. So, you know, actually think about, well, what am I good at in, in this kind of environment and, and what can I learn from other people? Uh, so rather, rather than trying to sort of do it all on your own, then, then work as a team. So if we're thinking about materials design, and I'm conscious that the chat is going on up there and see, uh, yeah. So there is a lot of literature out there on how long it takes to set up online courses and, and, and you know, the, the issues that, that are involved. Um, uh, but also to say to that, that things have changed dramatically. So the fact that, you know, that we can do this kind of work um, in a much more interactive way has, has changed things enormously. So I think the synchronous space and thinking about how to embed the synchronous space into the kind of work we perhaps already do online. So thinking about, well, what does that add to the materials we probably already have available? How do we adapt and, and do things? So not trying to sort of, you know, reinvent the wheel. The trouble is that a lot of, uh, uh, you know, school and, and university systems uh, are assuming people know nothing, uh, probably because they don't know very much and, and that can be quite problematic. So in terms of materials design, again, this came from an Eden talk. This is somebody called Lisa Maria Blackshay. So again, these are all, all linked together. She talked about this idea of backwards design and she based that on uh, John Biggs's model, which some of you probably be familiar with. John Biggs actually did a lot of his work. He's, he was a, a teacher in higher education. Uh, but it, and then at the end of his career in Australia, he actually moved to, to Hong Kong and he did a lot of his work in Hong Kong. So he coined this term constructive alignment, which essentially is what Blackshear is talking about. So think first about, you know, what what are the learning outcomes? So the idea of what is it we want the, the, the students to have achieved by the end of the session that we're running or the teaching materials that, that, that we set, set up. How, how do we actually know that the students have learned that? How, have we, how do we know that what we've presented is something that the students have, have engaged with and actually moved on and, and learned something from? Uh, and, and how will we, you know, how will we actually get students to, 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 to get there? So what are we going to do to, so if we set up the learning outcomes, um, we want to know how they learned, you know, how do we know that? And then 
the, the emphasis then on constructive alignment uh, that, that, that Biggs talks about is actually thinking about how are we assessing uh, the process. And we're not necessarily talking about formal assessment in the sense of examinations. We're talking about other forms of assessment along the way. So formative assessment, how do we you know, do, do, do assessment uh, as part of the process? So when we say assessment, it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we're talking about uh, you know, at, at the end of term examinations or weekly examinations or tests or quizzes, we're talking about, you know, the embedded assessment processes that go into, into a session. So, you know, first think about the assessment rubrics and, and then look at the learning activities. So that's the sort of way of, of sort of thinking about that. So, so this then uh, is a way of thinking about technology. Uh, so this, again, this picture is linked. Um, uh, you, if you click on it, it it'll take you to, uh, to, to the site where uh, these ideas are presented. Sorry, my... This, when I attach this new... Uh, so I'm having issues here that when I've attached, I've got a new uh, a microphone and I have a new camera and when I attach them, it, it seems to impact somehow on the way that, that, that I present things. So that's why the screen is moving. So this is a, a, an idea uh, of uh, your materials development, a sort of process of materials development. So there's a tendency uh, when we, we talk about online learning is to start with the technology and we all know what that's like universities, colleges, polytechnic schools, they buy a technology and then they expect you to use it rather than thinking about sort of students first, how easy is that technology to use, how cost effective it's going to be, the kind of characteristics, what sort of instructional strategies we can build in, does it enable us to have interaction, and then thinking about things like kind of organizational issues, how are we going to train people, how are we going to, to actually get it to work, um, how is it going to be actually installed on the systems, and then you know, how do we, we, we deal with security and privacy. So we're stuck with you know, those kinds of things often, um, and, and it's often very difficult to get around. I have a tendency to ignore uh, the, the, you know, my university, uh, and I use tools that perhaps uh, if the, the university knew that I was doing it, they wouldn't be very happy about it. Not that I hide uh, the fact that I do that. So, for example, Google is not something that is an accepted tool uh, at the University of Manchester because of what we call GDPR. You may not have heard of GDPR, um, but that's basically the, uh, the, the management of data uh, law that was brought in as part of the European Union a couple of years ago and, and is there to protect you know, consumers and users. Uh, so uh, where a, a, a website or a, an internet service is located outside of the European Union, it's not considered safe. So obviously Google, uh, unless it's installed on a local server, stores its data in the US, blah, blah, blah. blah. So, you know, that's the kind of you know, the issue that, that we're talking about. So but still, you know, I would suggest that, you know, it, it, it's a good idea, as I mentioned earlier, to actually look at what, what students uh, are actually doing, find out a bit from them what tools they prefer, what, what, what issues they have with them, and then try and embed some of that into the institutional structure. So, for example, in, in my own teaching, uh, I make use quite a lot of use of what are called wikis. Um, uh, wikis are kind of uh, if you don't know what they are, they're sort of, you know, a web page that you can interact with. They're a bit old hat now, maybe. Uh, a lot of them don't, don't look uh, as sexy as, uh, you know, more modern technologies, uh, but actually they're, they're very useful and effective. And I embed a lot of my teaching into wikis, and then I link those uh, wikis to, uh, to the Blackboard space that, that we make use of. Um, and then I'll set up forums in Blackboard and I'll link out to uh, particular spaces, that, that, that uh, particular parts of, of the site. So I'm kind of using that both externally and internally. So I'm using tools um, that, that make my life easier, hopefully make my students' lives easier. And then I can quickly and easily embed other tools into them. So I use, for example, tools like uh, H5P, um, uh, which is a, you know, a, a, an open source interactive tool, and I embed those, those kind of in, uh, interactive uh, materials in, in, into the wiki space alongside YouTube videos and so on and so forth. Okay, so, you know, making those, whoops, so 
So that's, I clicked. So that's the link to, this is Tony Bates's ideas and he's got a whole book online there. So uh, you can have a look at that later again, if you want to, a very useful uh, book to be thinking about. So other considerations that might be important for uh, actually, uh, so, uh, for uh, when you're thinking about online teaching and learning are things like asynchronous synchronous. So I'm sure you know what these terms mean, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, asynchronous is the is, is material that is offline essentially. So materials in a VLE uh, that, that people, uh, students actually engage with before or after courses, synchronous is this, so face-to-face -face kind of activity. Now, of course, you know, we're involved in, in those kinds of materials in our regular courses. I imagine that most of you have materials that you already use built into to your VLE. So it's, it's not a new concept. Um, the, the, the issue then of flexibility. So again, this is another term that, that, that has been, been uh, you know, used quite a lot in, in the world of online teaching, uh, th th that flexibility, the anytime, anywhere, any place that somebody mentioned on the Mentimeter. So, you know, it, and, and any tool basically these days as well. So it can, people can use their mobile phones equally well as, uh, you know, a, a, the kind of desktop computer you see uh, in the learning lab that we were talking about uh, before. So that's quite an old article now, but it still, it, it, it talks about flexibility and it looks at flexibility from the perspective of the student. So what is flexible to the student, not what is flexible to you. Uh, so again, it's going back to that idea of what is best for the learners. So if you want learners to buy into things, then engaging with, uh, with uh, the, 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 the students in, in that kind of way, um, uh, you know, making, trying to find out what, what, what they're interested in, being as flexible as you can according to, to the constraints of the system it is what you should be thinking about. And then other terms that I'm sure you're well familiar with are things like blended learning, and, and the flipped classroom. So traditionally blended learning is, is interpreted as the mixture between face-to-face -face and online, but actually, you know, what we're doing now is, is a form of blended learning. So we're blending the synchronous and the asynchronous, although I haven't got, you know, much asynchronous here. And then the term flipped classroom uh, is essentially a, a variant of that. So if people are not familiar with that term, uh, these guys, you know, come up Came up with a new definition of homework essentially so uh, and it's based around video um, and uh, the idea that you get learners to view materials or read materials potentially in advance and then they come in and discuss it so putting that emphasis on doing in the classroom things that that are um, you know rather than this which is essentially me talking to you uh, you know I would have set this this session up in advance we would come in and talk about stuff and, and we would you know, construct our ideas based on that. So it's built into to notions of, of constructivism. So that's the way it's sort of perceived. Another useful model, if you're not familiar with it, if you're thinking about online teaching and learning, this is Jilly Salmon's model. And this is much more about the way you begin to work with, with, with learners and making sure that, that you're thinking about all sorts of uh, uh, the elements that, that are involved in it. And this is, a, again, a, a slightly older model, but it's still very much it, it talked about and, and, and presented in, in the literature, but not forgetting about you know, you know, how people get onto the system, how people access and do things. So how do you, people talk about onboard, you know, onboarding uh, learners into the system? How do you begin your courses by, by getting people to sort of socialize? So actually spending time at the beginning, uh, trying to, to get people to engage, uh, you know, perhaps at quite a low level initially, not necessarily expecting too much at the beginning while people get sorted out. Certainly in my distance courses, I generally spend a, a quite a bit of time at the beginning uh, making sure everybody's in, in, in on board and, in, and engaging. So I have activities at the beginning of a course that are maybe not so serious, uh, that try and, and bring people into the course, trying to socialize people, trying to get students working in small groups independently. Um, and then we begin to sort of, you know, work to, towards, uh, you know, 
actually engaging with ideas. So, so doing material uh, at, at the beginning to, to, to get around some of the problems that, that you have. I mean, actually teaching people how to use the tools is, is really important. We often make assumptions about, about learners uh, that they can actually do stuff. So another model, again, uh, I find very helpful. Uh, this is good, what's called the community of inquiry model. Um, and it, again, it summarizes, if you like, some of the ideas that we've been talking about. So this idea of engaging with people in a social way, engaging people at a cognitive level. So actually giving people tasks that engage them, uh, perhaps in you know, more offline way. So actually engaging with ideas um, and then making sure that there's, there's there's presence from the teacher, but not too much, you know, so, so in terms of a, a synchronous session um, uh, that, that, you know, that perhaps you don't dominate it for an hour like I'm going to do here, um, but that, that you think about how you break things up and who's going to present stuff and, and, and how, how it's sort of rigged up in that kind of way. Um, but also if you're doing asynchronous work, so if you're asking students to engage with, with online material, um, you know, in a more tra traditional exercise or, or gap filling exercise or, or, or that kind of activity, there's opportunities for them to ask and answer questions. So mix that in, in with, with, you know, forum question and answer sessions. So, so if students are, are expected to work through some ideas, giving them some tutorial space, space to do that. So showing people that, that, that you're part of that, so you actually care about, about the, the results that you get. So here are some sort of general principles about uh, uh, that, that you, you might consider. So these are sort of a variety of, of, of recommendations that again, I've sort of pulled together from various spaces, some of my own, but, but some ideas that, that, that come from, from elsewhere. So I put a link there to uh, a PB Works, uh, a, a wiki space uh, that, that is essentially the course that I run at Manchester Language Learning and Technology. And, and that has a lot of information, a lot of references to, to if you want to follow up references, I notice people uh, are putting in uh, references to literature. So presumably if you work at various universities and polys, you can access those kinds of that kind of literature. So there's tons of stuff there uh, that, that you're, you're welcome to look at. So recommendations about ideas. So that's one link from me. So if you're not familiar with a tool, then, you know, run tests with friends and colleagues. So we're often kind of wary about doing that sort of because we don't want to show somehow that, that you know, that, that we don't understand or, or know things. Um, and certainly, you know, one of the, the I mean, I have two grown up children now, uh, both sort of, you know, full time workers. And, you know, I, I still buttonhole them every so often and say, can I try some ideas out? So when I first started using Zoom, um, I did a particular session for a group of teachers uh, in Manchester and I, you know, I, Sunday morning, I dragged my two kids in and, uh, and they really did show me that, uh, you know, that, that what I was planning wasn't going to work. So I kind of went away and, and rethought it. So it's always very helpful. Um, and of course, if you're already working in groups, designing and developing materials, that seems an obvious thing to do. And, you know, start, start small, start with what you know. So, you know, if, if you're, you know, wanting to use, uh, you know, word processing for, for process writing or, or some kind of collaborative writing process, um, you might start with, uh, you know, using Microsoft 365 or Word or whatever term we use to describe that now because that's your familiar tool. But, you know, have a play with, with Google Doc. I mean, Google Doc uh, has lots of additional facilities um, you know, that you can interact with it, you can see who's working. So if everybody's got a Google account specifically, you can track back to see, see what people have done. You can look at history. So, you know, essentially a Google Doc is, is very much like a wiki page in the sense that, you know, it maintains, uh, you know, a, a history of, of what people have done. So if you're setting up group work and, and you have that problem where, you know, students complain that, you know, X didn't do anything, so why should they get the same grade? as us or you know uh, uh, and all these kinds of things then you can actually as a teacher you can look back and see how much engagement that there was from you know different different participants so you know that's a variation if you regularly use a word processor for writing uh, in your classes uh, then uh, you know then 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 try a different tool to see, see what 
things. And again, there's plenty of literature on that if, if you want to look at it. You can use a wiki for that kind of stuff as well. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, in that uh, uh, Jilly Salmon model of the kind of in initial introduction, you know, use things like warmers to introduce, introduce you know, the spaces that you're going to use. So, uh, so if you're going to use breakout rooms, you might stick people at, you know, the beginning to sort of talk about a particular, you know, very little issue uh, and then, then bring them back in um, and, uh, you know, use that as, as a way of showing them how, how, how the tool works and, and also showing other people how the tool works. You can use external tools like Padlet or VoiceThread. Padlet, if you don't know, it is a kind of whiteboard system, uh, kind of better than the, the inbuilt system within Zoom itself. And then there's VoiceThread as well. Been around a long time again, probably a lot of people know that. Uh, good for, for, for listening, um, uh, developing listening skills material. Again, it's interactive. You can comment on, on you know, what, what people have said. Um, involve the learners. We, we said that kind of. Um, you know, you can use polls in Zoom, um, uh, you can use Mentimeter, but you can also use Google Forms. So again, if you've not experimented with uh, Google very much and, and it's a, a tool that, that, that you use, have a go with Google Forms. Google Forms is a fantastic tool um, and uh, it enables you to have a variety of different response times. So one of the big problems with a tool like Mentimeter or Socrative or these other kinds of tools or uh, you know, uh, 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 they, they, they're pretty limited. They're often just simple multiple choice, whereas Google Forms allows you to have long and short answers um, and, and uh, you know, enables you to have quite interactive stuff going on. Um, and it's good to, to use, uh, you know, use feedback as an ongoing form of collection about, you know, so you can use it uh, anonymously. You can use it, you know, collect data, you know, uh, with people's names on it, but you can also collect data without people's names on it so you can actually find out what's going on. And you can use those, those tools as, as, as a part of ongoing class. And then, you know, the ultimate thing is, you know, you've got to be flexible. You've got to be prepared to change as you go through. So I mentioned this earlier, you know, see this as an opportunity. So this is something in which you can develop your skills in a better way. So you can offer, you know, there are lots more jobs now teaching online than there were sort of six months ago. Most of my students uh, are, are applying for online teaching jobs and they're using the experiences they've had on the course. Uh, we, we ran some, you know, internship work at a local charity um, and they went online teaching, this is teaching asylum seekers and refugees in, in the UK. They used that experience as a way of, you know, persuading other people that they were fit, you know, uh, people to, to, to do this. So, you know, think of it as an opportunity. I know it's you know, hard, but, you know, try and think of it in that kind of way. Experiment, be creative, try different things, you know, not maybe at the first, you know, first time, but try and do things a different way. Have fun, make the learning fun, you know, so enjoy yourself in doing it. One of the things that was suggested in, in a discussion that, that, that was had at one of the sessions I attended was that, you know, having a routine, this is when people who've done a lot of work with remote teaching, so I don't know whether you're familiar with the Plan Sabel on Inglés project that, that comes out of Uruguay uh, in, in South America, uh, but one of my uh, colleagues, Graham Stanley, whose name you might be familiar with, uh, he was the director of that project for a while. Um, and I went along to a session with him and he was talking with one of the colleagues and they do this remote teaching where they actually work with teachers where, you know, you are the teacher in, you know, uh, you work with a local teacher. So they have connection, connectivity into uh, local schools, quite high tech connectivity. So the remote teacher works with the local teacher. They plan the lessons together uh, and, and, then, and then the local teacher works, uh, you know, um, in a face-to-face -face class sort of dealing with the kind of discipline and all that kind of stuff uh, as well as sort of also getting upskilled to some extent in their teaching processes so you know think about that kind of thing think about sort of team teaching but the idea of having routines and regularity maybe that's less important perhaps uh, you know at adult level but certainly uh, uh, with younger levels then, then then it's well worth having you know routines and think about rules as well. So, you know, the idea everybody's very disciplined here. You've all got your, you've all got your sound off um, and, uh, you know, nobody's interrupting. I can sort of see that, that sort of there's a certain amount of chat going on, but, you know, you're perhaps chatting privately and things like that. But 
<coughs> discuss that with the learners. So again, use that as a, a, you know, a warmer activity. You know, how do you think we should act and interact people in this classroom? What should we do? What, what are the possibilities? Um, so, and don't be tempted to make sessions too long. So I, I don't know what the, the, the requirements are with you, but you know, I, I think a maximum of an hour uh, you know sort of sitting in front of a screen even if you've broken the session up in, in different ways uh, would be uh, you know is worth thinking about so i mean there's an activity here we can do how much time have we actually got uh, adam in terms of the, the the session did you say it was an hour or um like we're planning like for you to talk for about an hour and then we'll also have more time for discussion at the end for more open okay. discussion yeah um, all right well what one more? Um, are you planning to use breakout rooms? Because we cannot. I'm sorry if you were. Okay. Well, I was. So that's useful to know. So I will have to be flexible then, won't I? Yes. <laughs> Before we keep you on your toes. <laughs> right, thank you very much. A little test for Gary here. All right. So one of the activities that I've used a few times. Uh, this is based on a, an activity that, that Nikki Hockley. Uh, created uh, and again there's an article about this if you want to follow this up you know when you're sitting here so you know it, we're, we're kind of what 40 minutes in we've all been sitting down so you say to people okay now go off into your into your house uh, and find something that's related to water uh, and bring it back so you know it can be a glass it can be a bottle or the, you know people you know people are creative they bring back all sorts of things i mean i did this with um, um, I did this with a group of science teachers um, and and what I did was I said right go and find an object that you might use in a science experiment um, and you know one group went off one came back with a, a tangerine another one came back with a you know a colander and then I said to them in your breakout rooms uh, you know uh, think about what sort of uh, a kitchen experiment you might do based on this. So they came up with some really creative ideas like, you know, using the colander to crush the, the tangerine and then, you know, and then, then test it for acidity and all sorts of things they were coming up with. So, you know, break it up. So, you know, people, you know, get bored and, you know, they, of course, they're going to be, you know, checking their mobile phones. Uh, who doesn't, you know, uh, during these sessions, particularly, you know, if you're busy people and, uh, and you've got lots of things to do. Um, you know, there's questions there about ELT PICS. ELT PICS is an open source uh, environment. Um, you can use those pictures uh, copyright, they're not copyright free, they're under Creative Commons, but yeah, they're, they're, they're fully available. So bring a picture in. So you can put a picture behind you so you can use, uh, you know, you can use the, the, the feature that I'm sure you're familiar with um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, using a background or you can just simply display the picture um, anyway uh, uh, as a screenshot or you can get the students to pick a picture or, you know, they can, they can, you know, pick a picture on their mobile phone. So another activity that I use quite often is sort of, you know, find a picture on your mobile phone that represents uh, what you do. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're available. Yeah, that's a good teaching tip, Adam. I like that teaching tip. So I didn't ask that question because I made the wrong assumption. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, you know, it is worth being sure about what, what is possible in the environment you're working in. I mean, you know, it, it's really useful uh, if you can. I mean, certainly in the early stages, I mean, is actually having sort of help with, within the classroom as well. So I think that's another, you know, useful teaching tip. So rather than trying to do things on your own, particularly if you've got larger classes, then uh, actually having sort of help supporting each other in that kind of way is really, really helpful. So things go wrong. Uh, you know, somebody suddenly tells you you can't use breakout rooms and you were thinking, ah, oh, yeah, I've got this really neat idea with the breakout rooms. Um, and establish what's called a back channel. So find a way of, you know, uh, because, you know, I, I'm lucky I have a fairly stable internet connection. I know that I'm going to you regret saying that, you know, I will suddenly get chucked out of here. Uh, and if you're the host, uh, then that could cause real problems, you know, so you have strategies for dealing with that. So, you know, if you have a, a WeChat group or a WhatsApp group or, uh, you know, you can say you can use Mentimeter in that kind of way. So that and, and you make it clear at the beginning that if I disappear, 
then you know X it can take over the host or make somebody co-host at the beginning so that at least they can keep the class going or, or whatever it happens to be. But you know, uh, you think about so things will go wrong. So think about how how to do that. So have the plan B. Uh, you know, a general plan, you know, idea, you know, if I, if I disappear, you can carry on working amongst yourselves and I'll try and get back in as quick as I can, you know, and, and, or, or specific thing. The other thing that's generally recommended is recording the sessions. I mean, again, this can be effective, uh, but it can also be a massive burden um, because you end up with a massive amount of, of, of material and, and how to display that. So, you know, maybe it's not always possible to, to, to record things and maybe your institution doesn't allow that anyway. I probably discover that, you know, <laughs> you don't allow recording either. Um, I mentioned the sitting down. I mean, I've now got one of the things I got. I have an external camera now so that uh, I can actually sort of show you some of my, you know, my hobbies and things like that. So we can talk about some of the things in, in my room or, or whatever. And, and that, of course, this is one of the things that allows me if I want to sort of stand up and keep doing the session. So uh, it, that is something I've recently got uh, from the university uh, to enable me to you know, be a bit more interactive in things. So the camera also on, on my laptop is not particularly good. I've also got a, you know, a decent quality microphone. That's the other thing that you know, I've been, we've been lucky. The university has actually invested in some of these things. Um, you know, think about yourself on the screen. So, you know, actually, you know, making sure that you look at people. So getting into the habit of actually looking into the camera. So, so you know, people feel that you're actually looking at them. Uh, I know that can sort of appear sort of quite you know, daunting in, in sometimes. You know, and getting the students so, you know, you're not in this situation where, you know, you've just got, you know, your glasses showing at the bottom of the screen or the students are, are, are not hiding. Um, and, you know, again, try not to be, you know, too, too distracting. So, I mean, it may be my, my background. I'm not quite used to this background yet. Um, you know, sort of think about what you're wearing. Um, you know, I mean, maybe you wear something specific to be, you know, to be controversial or to act as a warmer, but, you know, you know, thinking about what you're actually doing. Now, one of the things, again, is a bit controversial and it depends on, on students, uh, but uh, it's probably a good idea to, to at least start and, and finish with, with, with video on. What's the point of using a video conferencing system if you don't have video? I mean, I try and encourage my students to use video, but they have a tendency to, 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 to turn it off. Think about your body language. I mean, you can, you know, uh, you can use body language. So you see, I'm kind of beginning to sort of wave my, my hands around and this kind of stuff, sort of emphasize things and do stuff in, in that kind of way. Think about your use of voice. Uh, think about, you know, make sure you're, you know, you're you know, try and you know, use normal modulation rather than people have a tendency when they're using uh, technology uh, to actually over speak. Uh, and it's not necessary, you've got a decent microphone. You know, try and get the best tech you can again. So I've take, taken on board that and I've tried to get a better camera and a better microphone. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can zoom in and out. This, this technology uh, doesn't actually do zooming in and out. Um, and you can use different kinds of whiteboards. Um, and for example, you know, I have an uh, iPad. If you have access to an iPad, you can actually link one of the links that you can make uh, the connections you can make in Zoom is to an iPad and then you can actually have uh, a whiteboard uh, on your iPad and, and if you have one you can you know you can and then write on that. I mean that's particularly important maybe if you're teaching languages where there's a need to actually uh, you know to, to, to write more but perhaps that less true when, when you're teaching English. So I was then going to put you in great breakout rooms to, to, to talk about this unit that you sent me Adam. So um, I, uh, I wonder if we can kind of do that in, in chat. So if, I, if, if people want to have a look at this link, so let me, just, let me just stop sharing for a second or stop sharing generally. Um, and uh, where's that gone? Do, do, do. So I've got two screens and I've moved stuff across. So if I stop sharing a second and I put a link to that material into the chat room. Okay. 
All right, some of you have already got there, so. So this was some material that was sent to me by Adam and I had a look through it and I thought about uh, you know, how I might break that up. So I was told that this was material that um, uh, you would particularly use. It might take a couple or three sessions, two or three hours to work through. And I thought how, if I was going to adapt that, how I would make use of it. So do you want to have a look at it um, just for a few minutes? Um, just get a sense of it. You might well know the material well anyway. And what sort of ways might, might, might you change that? How would you adapt that, taking into account some of the things I've said about synchronicity and asynchronicity, the sort of tasks you might, might be better for offline and uh, online, the kind of ideas about uh, how it might be presented. So can everybody sort of get out and look at that material? Is that... And you might like to, after say two or three minutes, five minutes or something, having a look at that, uh, we could come back. You could put questions in, in the chat area or we could, you could throw up your hands and, and, and talk about that material. And then I can show you what I thought. And what do you think? So we can't use chat room, uh, breakout rooms for that. So have a look at the material, have a think about it. And then maybe have a couple of minutes break and then and I'll have a look back through the chat and see. So has anybody got any ideas about how you might break that material up and use it in, in different kinds of ways? And I, you know, obviously there, there's no right answer to this question. Anybody want to offer any, any ideas about how you might do it? Maybe you know, get some voice in here rather than just chat. What would you do with that? Or what do you do with that? Maybe it's not a matter of what would you do, it's what do you do? Just maybe you already use it. Anybody wanna be brave and say something? Or shall I just talk through my ideas? I think, I mean, if, uh, for section one, uh, the problem, the solution, if you put them in a Google form or in Padlet and ask them to identify the problem. I mean, I, I, I've observed classes where um, the teachers have asked the student to identify the problem and then they try to type in the problem really quickly. And, and it, eventually all the groups come up with more or less same idea. So that could be done by Padlet or Google form. I mean, that could be easily translated into Google, Google form and co-construct the list on problem and solutions. Okay. So we've got various ideas coming up. It's a 
bit of music coming through Adam. So. Do people like the music? I'll leave my mic on if they like the music. <laughs> it's quite useful to have that, you know, sort of as people are sort of thinking about things. So, yeah. I'm thinking of taking part ownership in this cafe because I'm the only customer usually. So. <laughs> I might as well keep the money I spend here. I might as well go back into my pocket. <laughs> might as well, yes. Okay, so people are coming up with different kinds of ideas. So yeah, you you could yeah, you can obviously either use some of this uh, so for example i mean my idea is let me just sort of i was just sort of looking through the document yesterday sort of thinking about how i might sort of break it up let me see if i can show you some of the ideas some of those ideas are things that people have already suggested anyway um, let me see if i'm sharing that screen can you see that my version of the document yeah can you see that um, we did see it, now it's gone to a, a beach. We can see a beach. Okay, <laughs> let me back put it. <laughs> no, right, we can see so it now, yeah. All right, so it's on a different screen. So this is, uh, yeah. So, I mean, essentially, uh, I just put, uh, I thought that, you know, maybe some of this could be done in advance. So this would be a bit of a flipped classroom option. Um, so they could be sent this material in advance, uh, perhaps. Uh, you know, this could be discussion that's done in a VLE. So you could set up, say, okay, I want you to have a look at this text and, and you, you set the material up in, in that kind of way. So you've got that mixture of asynchronous and synchronous. I put discussion forum uh, or WeChat. So, you know, you could have a little bit of, you know, initial discussion. So you get a sense of what they do and don't know um, about that. And then uh, something like that, that activity there could perhaps be done uh, in, uh, you know, in breakout rooms so that they could, when they come into the class, they could do that. Um, I thought these, this sort of section of materials where you've got you know, ideas about improving your style, they could practice those independently. They could be set up as, as tasks um, in, in different kinds of tools, either embedded within a, a VLE like Blackboard or independently in something like H5P. Um, I then thought, so there's quite a lot of, you know, reading there uh, and, and then some sort of activities that, that followed that. So there seemed to be stuff that they could do online. But of course, you know, you could, if, if you've got the kind of material that reports to you how students are doing, uh, so you can see how many people have got the material right or wrong. Uh, so you often within virtual learning environments, you have that option to actually view how people have done on tests. You, you, could, you could sort of set that up in a second sort of synchronous session and deal with the issues that people have had. Um, then again, this could be done. This is not such a big task, I don't think. So this could be done. Uh, you know, in small groups, uh, it could be done uh, either either in small groups, async, you know, not asynchronously, but they could do small group work, you know, themselves outside of class and bring those ideas in, or you could do that as breakout rooms, so they could talk about that kind of thing uh, in, in the class, and then you've got a bunch of activities that they could perhaps do in small groups. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what that picture told me about. Um, then you could, you know, set the, uh, the hedging, uh, stuff about hedging for homework. Uh, so again, they go back to sort of thinking about hedging and do the activities that are based there. Um, and then at the end, I thought this probably needed to be, there needed to be some sort of writing activity so they could demonstrate, you know, a bit like an IELTS exam, they could actually demonstrate that they've understood it. So rather than just doing the exercises, you know, that's that notion of, you know, constructive alignment you're thinking about ultimately the ultimate thing is that you want them to be able to write that kind of piece of work um, and demonstrate that they can hedge that they can use appropriate academic language so some form of output might might, might be important so you know those were essentially uh, the the ideas that, that i had and some of you in the chat have suggested some of those things anyway um, so you're clearly all on the right page when it comes to this, or some of you are anyway. So, so that's about an hour's chat from me. Um, 
I've got a few more slides at the end there, but they're mostly links to, to external materials um, so that people can, can look at that. So there is a lot of stuff out there that, that you can you know, already make use of. You don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. I have a question for you, Gary. Um, like you initially said, you said um, set things as for a task for students to do before the lesson, but what we like in the flipped classroom, but what we find is quite often the students don't do it or like half, uh, half the students don't do it, half will do it. And then that makes it more difficult to do the synchronous part of the lesson when we've got some students are ahead of the other students. Any any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's normal practice, isn't it? I mean, I think uh, one of the things that, that uh, again, is suggested and something I kind of pretty regularly do is try and find out who, who's done it in advance. So you can do a quick poll at the beginning and say, you know, uh, I understand not everybody has necessarily had a chance to do this. Can, can we have a sense of who's done it? Uh, you could then put people into mixed groups uh, where people who've already done the activity are working with people who haven't done the activity and they can exchange ideas on that. So if you've got the access to breakout, do you not have access to breakout rooms at all then? Is well, that we do, we do have access, but we have, you have to enable them before you start the session. And okay. the person who's hosting this did not enable them. So that's, I think once they're enabled, they're kind of enabled all the time. Okay, well, that, that's yeah. fine. So, I mean, I'm just saying, just checking. So, you know, you can then put people so you know in into breakout rooms you can choose who goes into a breakout room so you can get you can do a poll um, and and find out who's done so the polls don't have to be anonymous they can you know actually you know, tell you who's who you can then select who goes into the breakout room and, and discusses things so you know that's that you know that, that's one way around it i mean it's it's never going to be perfect but but that's worth doing but uh, you know i mean i suppose uh, trying to uh, you know, get them to do that kind of thing together synchronously uh, rather than, than, you know, so they, they do uh, small group work outside of the classroom. So again, that puts a certain amount of pressure on them to, to actually engage with that. So there's the kind of couple of solutions that I might have. Right. James, do you have a microphone? You can tell us if you want. <laughs> You don't need to use your, your um... There you go. How about that? Um, yes, I've typed, uh, I use a ransom number generator, which would be good, really. Make I a bit more profit it. on the lesson. But um, what I meant was a random number generator. So students know that they may get asked to, uh, um, uh, uh, for the class to see their homework. So you, you can't look at everybody's, but you can look at uh, two or three uh, and I, I found that if if students know that they may well be asked then they um, they're much more likely to do it i i have found as a sort of wider issue i i, I found that uh, it's students need to do more out of class if they're if we're doing online lessons or we, we get behind and that being so i i think it's it's what I ask them to do out of class is more important. So I, I follow up on it much more, you can say strictly than I would in a face-to-face -face classroom setting. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. There's some good ideas there. Yes, I think, you know, if people, you know, there is the jeopardy there that, you know, they are going to get challenged to, to mm -hmm. sort of show that they've done something in front of other people, then I, I think they're much more likely to, to, to kind of engage with that. You know, again, it's not cast iron, is it? You can't. No, 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 no. I mean, you, <laughs> I, I asked them first, has nobody, has anybody not done it? And you accept if there's one or two reasonable excuses. But. Sure. But again, I think using polls in that kind of way and, and yeah. maybe sort of building their confidence in terms of the fact that, you know, there's not going to be a big retribution about no. it. You know, people are encouraged to do it. And, and, and you know, yes. ultimately that, that if they don't do it, they're not going to progress, are they? So Right, right. But if you can use a bit of peer pressure, I think that that, that helps. Absolutely, yes. Does anyone else have questions for Gary or other points to make? Hi, Gary. Yeah. Hello. Um, Hello. Could you say a 
Could you say a bit more about the H5P tool that you've mentioned? Sorry, I should start my video. Sorry, that was rude. <laughs> Um, okay. yeah. the, the H5P, it seems to be a kind of a programming tool. So what have you actually used it for to create your own activities? A bit like the old um, hot potatoes thing? Or? It, it's a bit like the old hot potatoes thing, but, but, but more modern um, okay. and, uh, and open source. So it's updated. Uh, hot potatoes have gone, disappeared. Uh, it partly depends on what you've got available on your system. So. Uh, I mean, I, I still tend to use, uh, uh, you know, open source software because of the communities that I work with. Uh, you know, it, it's obviously we have you know, disparate communities uh, with different levels of access to, to materials um, and resources. So I tend to use uh, open source materials because of that. But quite often, if you work within an institution, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can make use of, I mean, in Blackboard, we have a, a whole series of uh, kind of typical quizzes, they tend to call them quizzes at Manchester, uh, that, that you, you can embed and, and, and you know, re, redo things. But H5P is open source. It has quite a nice interactive video tool um, yes, I've just uh, read that. What, what does that mean exactly? Well, well essentially, you can, you can import uh, a YouTube or Vimeo video into, into H5P, and then you can, you can do things like pause it um, and, and have uh, questions, uh, you know, sort of thinking questions or follow-up questions. Uh, and they, you, know, you can like make Edpuzzle, it. then. Similar to, Ed, similar to Edpuzzle. Do you know that one? I don't actually know that, but yes, I imagine that. Yes, that, that, okay. that's, yeah, there, there are lots of tools like it. So Nearpod is another tool that, that allows that sort of facility, yeah. um, you know, is one we have, we use at Manchester. But, but I, I, I recommend H5P only because it, it, it's open source really. But if you, you know, you're already using other tools inside your institution, there's no reason uh, necessarily to, to, to use them unless they add something to, to what you do. So because I use the wiki, I then embed, you know, I, I'll, I'll embed those kinds of tools in so I can embed kind of Google tools as well. So, Thank you. I mean, it partly depends on how you're using it as well, you know, so, so if, if it's for independent study, I mean, the more support you can give people, the better. So, you know, you can you know, give them clues and ideas so that, you know, I mean, there's this assumption around the flipped classroom that, that somehow this is an easy thing to do. And, and there's in, in, I think, you know, for people who are perhaps working with, with students who are working in schools in their first language, then okay. But if you're working with second language students uh, and you're using something like video for input, you, you need to provide additional support for them. Yeah, all right, thank you. I've just realized that I committed the cardinal sin and you can only see the top half of my head. That's, That's absolutely I'm, right. I, I, I wasn't going to say that, uh, Alison, but uh, it's I did because I'm sitting that. on a yoga ball. In my defence, I've taken Kira's advice, and I'm too short to sit on the ball. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Down, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I mean, it's not a cardinal sin, but you know, if you want to encourage people to engage with, it is very difficult to get people to use video. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm always surprised. I mean, I always forget how long I've actually been using these tools and it is a long time uh, that mm. I've been engaged in using tools like this. So I don't find that a problem. But and I'm also surprised that students who kind of, you know, happily use uh, FaceTime or, or, you know, WeChat sort of, you know, equivalent or, you know, WhatsApp sort of calls, you know, struggle when it comes to actually showing themselves on screen. And mm. yeah, I mean, maybe it's because they're, you know, they haven't brush their hair or or whatever uh, in advance of the class and, and you can understand yeah oh, okay um you know that that's you know something that you know difficult anything else other things i just noticed somebody was talking about downloading the the uh, that link is to the google document online um, and I can, if you want, send Adam, uh, a, a, I can download a copy of it as a PowerPoint if people would like it, prefer it as a PowerPoint. 
uh, but uh, that, uh, I'm happy to do that if people want that. Anything else? Any other ideas you can give me? <laughs> well, you talked about uh, using some of the Google uh, tools, Gary, but I, I find that um, uh, Google Docs really works well. Yeah, who's that speaking? Sorry, is that? Sorry, it's uh, James. I uh, seem a bit laggy, I'm afraid. Um, right. I, I, I find getting students in groups and, and doing things on different Google Docs works very well. Um, that's just one thing that I use all the time. If you set up some open access Google Docs, you can use the same ones with all of your classes, you know? Absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, one of the things that uh, teachers at, at Manchester showed me, uh, which I hadn't thought of, was actually you, you can have different, you can set up, you know, a, a, a Google uh, slide uh, and you can have different groups working on different pages within the slides as well. So rather than having separate docs uh, or separate slides, you can actually you know, you can say if you've got a, an activity that will fit on a slide, uh, like a discussion or, a, you know, a, 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 you know, activity where they've got to move pictures around or something like that, they can all work on, on, on uh, different parts of, of the same set of slides as well. So that's another way of using it. So. Just wonder if you have any good suggestion for a group presentation when uh, most of the presenters are not in the same venue. I mean, because a lot of our assignment right now is asking students to do group presentation. And they may be sharing the screen and it may, I mean, I, I, I don't know what are the tools that uh, besides Zoom that can help them to have a pretty seamless um, presentation. How do you mean? You know, different tools that you can use uh, yes. for, for yeah. group presentation. Yeah. I mean, they, they all work in, in, in a similar kind of way. I mean, I think it's about the logistics of, of, of getting, making sure that, you know, that, that, that they agree amongst themselves who's presenting what mm. um, and uh, that people understand how co-hosting works. Um, and those kinds of things. So, you know, as a, as a teacher, you have to be prepared to give uh, the students uh, access uh, to uh, to some of the higher level, uh, you know, functions that, that normally they, they'd be denied. So it's a matter of training them how to do it. It's like anything, I think. So, you know, if you were going to ask them to do a PowerPoint based presentation in class, presumably you'd spend some time helping them to, to to develop that and so that they, they could make a good good fist of it uh, and I think the same would be true uh, of working in this kind of environment so you know as well as training teachers which is what we, we're kind of focused on at the moment I think we have to we have to make students aware of it we can't make the assumptions that people so often make that, that these students automatically know how to use these tools they, they manifestly don't in, in many cases or they they've got a rough idea but they've never really done a presentation and you know in terms of justifying it, it it's to me it's about the kinds of skills they might well need in the workplace over the next few years uh, as you know pandemics continue to you know come through uh, one after another you know it, 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 this is not going away um, and uh, so you know working online and understanding how to make online working work is you know it, it is a really good you know skill for people to develop and I you know I often justify the use of technology in the classroom through actually through that by saying you know this is the kind of work that you're going to be doing so but I think we have to train people how to do it. We can't assume that, that, that students, however digitally savvy they appear to be, are actually capable of doing the sort of things that we're asking them to do. Hi, uh, Gary, this is Adam. Um, like, what, what are your views on, we've been moving a lot of our 
speaking assessments to asynchronous. So they would do a presentation as a video, record the video, then, then submit it, rather than doing it synchronously, mainly because we were worried about, worried about technical problems when we have all the class having to come online and say more after each other and doing it synchronously. Um, any views on that? Well, like, there's advantages and disadvantages of doing it synchronously, asynchronously. Any opinion? I mean, it's not something I've had to do because I mean, I'm not sort of doing direct language teaching, but I think that sounds a good idea. Why not? I mean, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, I mean, there are obviously sort of questions that are not going to be questions about, you know, who's done it. It's not like a written test or something like that. So, you know, those kinds of issues about, you know, uh, making sure that the, the, the students are, are doing the thing themselves. But I don't, I don't see why that's particularly a problem. Well, what we find is they're increasingly reading a script when they're doing it, when they're recording a video. And so again, it's, it's a new skill of looking at the camera when you're recording a video and that's what they need to learn. And then like with Christy's question about um, a group presentation, then they have to learn the technical skills of editing the video so it's all put together and making sure they all have a similar background or something or else it will look quite strange. So it, new, new skills they're learning as you say for workplace. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I think again, you know, we have to make sure that, that you know, it, that, that we make it clear, you know, so it's part, you know, so you're awarded points so when you set up your assessment rubrics, you know, you, you, you say, OK, you will get better points if you speak this spontaneously. So spontaneity of spoken language, it gets gets a higher mark than, 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 than a red script. But, you know, there are an awful lot of people in the world, um, you know, who, 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 you know, who, who use scripts. Uh, on a regular basis. So, you know, most of our political classes, you know, wouldn't dream of saying something that was unscripted. Um, and one of my colleagues, uh, you know, uh, at the university, I mean, used to, I mean, essentially what he did was he wrote the script and then he basically learnt it. Um, so that, and he would try and then, you know, say, say it in as natural a way as possible. And you couldn't really tell uh, that he he kind of practiced that, but that was a particular kind of speaking. I guess it depends on what kind of spoken language we're talking about. Well, there's a question in the chat from Jay um, about participation grades. Or any thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, I certainly something that that people uh, you know do use. Uh, you know, it, and I think that's yeah. The, you know, it is it, certainly uh, we have sort of a, a system of you know. A, a very modest sort of uh, additional points that you can get. So, you know, you can boost your score a bit by getting some some form of participation grade. I certainly do that uh, with some of the, the work I do uh, when I'm, I'm doing uh, working with our undergraduate students and, and to encourage them to actually engage in an activity or make it sort of 10% of, of the overall score um, so that they have to demonstrate that they've done a task. Um, and, and so, yeah, the, the kind of idea of awarding a few percentage points for participation so that they can boost their score. I don't see that that's a big problem. I think that's quite, quite a useful the, idea. The problem we're having is, is how to measure it or how to make it objective measure. And we're thinking, well, is it possible to have an objective measure for participation? And so then it becomes, OK, we just make it subjective. <laughs> but we, we don't have an answer yet. Yeah, I mean, I think all those things are very difficult. I think you have to experiment and, and see. Mm. And again, you know, talk to the students about what they feel about that kind of thing and about why, do, why don't they contribute in class when they know, you know, that, that doing a presentation, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bit of a struggle. Uh, we, we have, we've moved all of our PhD vivas online for obvious reasons. Um, and of course, a massive amount of angst, but but, but at the same time, you know, if, if you don't perform in those kinds of environments, then you're not, you, you're, you're not going to get on and you're not going to get a job either. So I think, you know, having the debate and discussion around, you know, why they're doing that and, and, and what constitutes that, uh, then I think it, it is, is useful to have that with the students. You know, it's like setting up the rules, you know, so, you know, we've all got kind of, you know, most of the people on, you know, the front screen I can see you know I've got sort of cameras on and and when I scroll back through 
most of the people haven't. I mean, that's because, you know, the, the system pushes people with, with cameras to, to the, the front of the, the queue. But, you know, talking to people about, you know, you know why it's a good idea to, to do that and, and, and be able to sort of kind of interact and, and do things. Any more questions? Any more comments from for Gary or for everyone? I mean, there's a point there from, from Alan about, you know, perhaps set up some guidelines for what you mean by participation. So again, you could discuss that with the students. So that can become a task, you know. So, you know, we have to mark you for participation. What do you think that constitutes? How, how am I supposed to do this? You know, I've got to give you a score for this. What do you think, you know, you know and, 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 and build it on, on what they do. And then they'll offer that to the department. I mean, one of the, the activities I did a couple of years ago, we were revising our assignment rubrics. So I said, can I, you know, I debated it with the students and we set up a new rubric for the, uh, the uh, activities that we were working on. So these were collaborative activities that, that the students did. So I gave them some examples and I told them to look at the, uh, the, the rubrics, the marking rubrics, and they came up with a really nice sort of set of ideas about, you know, which were then embedded in, into, into the final kind of rubric. So, yeah. They, they will engage with that kind of thing if you give them the opportunity. So ask them, you know, what they think. We tend not to talk to the students. We had a couple of colleagues who did that. Um, Chrissy, Jane, are you here? Um, you, you had student negotiated rubrics, I think, didn't you? I'm not sure if they want to speak or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just unmuted. <laughs> um, okay. We did. I think it's um there might be a bit of red tape in in being able to do this i'm lucky that oh I don't, maybe jane is here as well but she is um uh in charge of our assessments so that cut a lot of red tape and and she was able to um you know how implement it in a way that was um you know pedagogically sound and we had a new course that was starting um and it actually worked really quite well the students you know took ownership of what they were expected to do and their ideas were pretty much in line with, with what we had in line. This was for a storytelling course. So, um, you know, they, they forgot a few things. They didn't remember pronunciation might be an issue that, that should be assessed and, and things like that. Um, yeah. But I, I, I like that. I love the idea of them taking ownership of, okay, we're all gonna be participating together online. What does that look like? What kind of engagement should, should, should we expect of you? I think student is kind of flipping the tables on them. They may not be, you know, used to that kind of conversation of them taking the responsibility. Another way of doing it, and I think they're excellent ideas, is is actually getting them to grade each other. I mean, uh, you know, that, that again is is problematic, and they often, in my experience, they tend to give lower grades than than, than the tutor. But if you have the system where you know they initially kind of you know give grades and 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 then. Uh, you know, you say that all of these will be sort of teacher moderated and that you justify the changes that you make a bit like, you know, the algorithms in in the UK at the moment. So, you know, teachers, sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, has a view on that. I think think that also works. And I think the idea that, that you know, that then pronunciation becomes part of the discussion. So, you know, so that you're reminding them that these things are important. So, so they've forgotten that and, and, and that gets thrown in. So people are kind of reminded that that's why I kind of engaged with, with looking at the rubrics with my students because they don't often look at them. So they don't really know why they get the grades they get. And so they have a much better understanding and they were very good at actually uh, manipulating some of the better students. They were very good at justifying why I should give them a better grade than, than, than I thought I should have done. That's a really, really interesting sort of process. Any more questions or comments? Maybe there any more last questions? 
Um, you can, can show the feedback form, but we will also send it to you. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, sorry. We have a short feedback form. Um, Lucas is going to show that, but we will also send that as an email. So, um, Lucas, can you put that link in the chat, please? So you're already using Google Forms anyway, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, we find Google Forms is the easiest to use. Yeah. And we're still yeah. able to use it in Hong Kong. I mean, I agree. I mean, I, I just wish I could persuade the university. Um, the, the really good system actually um, uh, is, is the, the WeChat mini program. So uh, we, we do a lot of WeChat with, with our students and uh, that, uh, there's a, a system called mini programs and they're really good for feedback and things like that as well. But, but in Hong, I mean, in China, uh, students can't access Google. And also at Hong Kong, you, uh, we have been told from next semester, we should not use Google at all. We should change to um, OneDrive. Microsoft, yeah. Yeah. Oh. So we can't, we are not allowed to use, to use Google for, I mean, I. This whole project, we, we use Google, and I have been using Google with my students too. Um, so we have to actually figure out how to, you know, do interactive writing using OneDrive, which I have to explore further to see how we do that. Yeah, it's yeah. not as easy. Let me let me tell you because I've been playing with that as well. Uh, people have to be registered, so there's a level of security in the system that makes it more difficult. I'm really worried that that the university is going to turn around and say, you can't use Zoom anymore because, uh, you know, you can use Microsoft Teams because it's cheaper for us. Um, and, uh, you know, Again, at Hong Kong U, we are saying that we should try to change to um, Microsoft Teams, but they're not restricting us from using Zoom in the next semester. But with Google, we can't at Hong Kong U. I think, you know, you have to try and resist that because it's just, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I know, know it's not and, possible to really fight these battles, but people. it's worth telling people these things. So. For myself, I always go back to Google Docs because it's the most user-friendly and easy to use for students yeah. if you want to do group writing. It's just so easy to use. Uh, as James, James Nichols was saying, it's compared to other systems, Google Docs just works. Yeah. That's the um, university's regulations. They send that to all the staff. So. Yeah, I mean... Uh, when, when was it? Jack is talking about security issues oh, with Zoom yeah. and, and, you know, there are security issues with all tools, I think, so. Yeah. Oh, uh, Please, everyone, complete the survey. And um, remember, we have two. We have two more talks coming up. One with I can't remember. Lillian, can you remember oh, when? Um, <laughs> okay, that is on the sixteenth of September, a Wednesday, uh, which is on uh, adapting materials for the remote classroom. And it beats each sheet. Yes. And then we have one in October on assessment. Um, we'll give you more details about that one later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Gary. Thank you very much for a very Thank interesting you. talk, Gary. Yes, and good to see all the colleagues from different centres here. Uh, it might be the only time that we really see each other through these kind of online sessions. Um, I miss the, the time seeing colleagues, you know, face to face. I guess that's what lot of you also feel about. Mm. So thank you for coming, thank you for participation and thank you again Gary um, for your sharing and colleagues. Um, this